within government, park rangers, a variety of people, or people who are just interested to go out, look at birds, and contribute to conservation. Because it's a volunteer program, we recognize that the numbers of birds that can be counted annually will vary. The sites that are covered annually will vary. And so you can see over the life of the Asian water bird census, we have quite a number of changes in terms of sites covered, uh, birds covered. Um, sorry, no, it doesn't show you birds, but total sites covered, and per region, how many sites are covered. The data that uh, is generated helps to come up with uh, information on distribution of populations, and this is an example for the northern pintail. You can look at the coverage, therefore, of the sites during the water bird census. This species is pretty widespread across uh, um, Asia, down to the tropics, down to the equator, sorry. And for where we have good reliable data, which can be tested using statistical methods, we can use uh, for example, trim, and it shows us over this period of time, over the last 10 years, you've got a decline in the population of the pintail. <coughs> we heard, we've heard about regional program, but really we depend on strong national programs or sub-national programs, uh, site-based programs, which should provide good, reliable information. And I just use the example of Hong Kong here, where Besides the census, which contributes to the International Water Bird Census in January, they undertake monthly counts for all water birds. They, count, they undertake specific egrets count, egret, egret counts for the nesting egrets, of which there are large colonies in Hong Kong. As well as, throughout the year, they take, undertake shorebird counts because they recognize that Hong Kong is a specific, uh, especially important place for shorebirds, and through a regular monitoring scheme, you get much better information than with single counts. To support the development of the Asian Water Bird Census, the national coordinators came together in 2006 to develop what's called the Development Strategy, 2007 to 2015. So this strategy still guides the implementation of the uh, Asian Water Bird Census. Here's a snapshot of the coordinators who came together in the Philippines. Uh, to discuss this uh, issue and come up with a strategy. And that strategy has <coughs> seven objectives. I won't go into the detail of it, but basically it looks at how can we strengthen the census on an annual basis, improve coverage of sites, improve consistency of coverage, build the capacity of the network, secure the resources needed to undertake this work, and come up with good results that are used at the local level, national level, and international level to support water bird conservation and wetland conservation. And to give you a flavor of how this feeds into different programs, at the site level, the sites that are being counted in the census, they help with site designations as protected areas, as Ramsar sites, or flyway network sites, such as in the East Asian Australasian flyway site network. At the national level, they can help in planning, uh, so, uh, support implementation and development of the NBSAPs, National Biodiversity Action Plans, and a number of other policies that are developed by different countries. Going up to the regional level or the flyway level, they help in implementation and address the needs of the flyway partnership in this region, the East Asian Oscillation Flyway Partnership, and uh, Spike will talk to you about that uh, after this. Or in other parts of the world, it helps the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement, the EU legislation, in the Americas it helps the Western Hemisphere Showbird Reserve Network and other programs that are looking at water bird conservation in different flyways. And finally it feeds into the global level policy and uh, frameworks such as the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, the Convention on Migratory Species, CBD, the IUCN Red Listing, the important bird areas and a number of other programs. Uh, I'm using one example in the subsequent slides, and that is the water bird population estimates, which brings together this information and analyzes it at a population level. The water bird population estimates is the formal document that governments use to identify 1% populations of water birds to designate Ramsar sites. And it covers a large range of 
families listed here at the bottom. We've just launched in 2012 at the Ramsa conference uh, in Bucharest in July, the fifth edition of this water bird population estimates. In the past, these were hard copies, and obviously with any publication that's a hard copy, it means that there's a limited print run, and it quickly gets outdated, and it gets out of print, and if you have a copy of any of these past editions, please hold on to it, because they are collector's items. <laughs> but not for long, because we found a solution for the world's problems. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, if you look at the outcomes of the analysis of the water bird population estimates 5, this gives us the distribution of water birds around the world using the Ramsar regions as a basis. And what I draw your attention to here is the blues, which indicate what percentages of the populations are without any estimates. So it shows us that we still have a lot of gaps in terms of knowledge about the status of populations in all parts of the world, but particularly in the African Eurasian region, as well as in the Neotropics. Much better information is available on the populations in the African Eurasian region. If you look again at this data, we can see that Asia again stands out, whoops, almost, stands out in terms of populations for where the data shows us that populations are declining the most. So that's really a worry that within Asia, although we are getting better information, and for some populations there is an improvement on the whole as across the regions, the decreasing populations are largely in Asia. We can look at this data per family, and the story is quite different depending on the family of water birds we're looking at. And I won't dwell on the detail of this graph, but you can see between the different families, let's take flamingos at the bottom, or ducks, geese, and swans, you can see that a, a small proportion of the flamingos are declining, whereas a much larger proportion of the ducks, geese, and swan are declining. The numbers of populations per family are obviously very different. There are far fewer flamingos than ducks, geese, and swans. If you look at the red listed species, the threatened species, the globally threatened species around the world, at a family level, again, the picture is very different. Some families, such as cranes, are outstanding in terms of their threats, uh, threatened status, whereas some populations of some species seem to be doing much better. But this is really not a cause for celebration, because on the whole, water birds are doing badly, Nearly 24% of the world's water bird species are threatened globally, and we need to do a better job to protect them. If you look at this summary uh, slide by major region again, Asia Pacific stands out as the region that really is struggling, where the largest proportion of populations are declining. So, I started telling you that uh, you'd better hold on to your water bird population estimates uh, publications because the fifth edition is an online version and you can now go on to the website and you can access information about all the water bird populations that we've produced in the past. And for example, the Spoonbill Sandpiper, if you type uh, the search, you get a page which tells you some basic information about the name of the species, where it's found, um, which protection status or which protection um, framework is available at the moment. So the East Asian Flyway Partnership as well as the Central Asian Flyway Action Plan are two frameworks for its conservation. And if you flip uh, or continue scrolling down, it gives you information as to the population per, um, per edition of the water bird population estimates. And basically you can see that the 1% has declined very rapidly for this species gives you information on references that you can click on, as well as notes. This can be downloaded from the website, and you can use this information. Besides the information on populations, there's a lot of other information on the website, which is basically what are water birds, defining what are populations and species, or how the estimates calculated and reported on in this, in this website, and the basic FAQ. So I'd encourage you to go onto the website and have a look at it 
And if you have feedback, comments, suggestions, improvements, we'd really appreciate receiving that. I just end now with the priorities uh, section, which is, I think, the basis for some discussion out of this. I won't go through the detail of it. I just want to list them all quickly. Basically, we are looking at how can we improve water bird monitoring to help prioritize areas for conservation, sites for conservation, species for conservation, and support better capacity building in country and at the regional level for conservation. We would like to continue using the International Water Bird Census as one of the major global frameworks for conservation action through monitoring. And we invite you to support this at a local level, at a national level, and at an international level. This meeting brings forward a resolution, a motion that will be considered as a resolution that calls for your support. And we would really encourage you to consider this. The water bird population estimate uh, web portal will continue to function, but it will only be improved with your support. So we call on your support for this as well. And I think uh, this sort of summarizes the various conventions, international agreements at the global level, at the flyway level, and some of the programs that are using this information. So the red list of the IUC and SSC, which BirdLife is the official partner the important bird areas program of uh, bird life are also the major users of this data. And that's the web address. It's very simply wpe.wetlands.org. These are the people who need to be thanked for providing comments at the final stages and talking about these issues at a meeting here in Korea a couple of years ago. And I'd like to thank formally the funders of the water bird population estimates, the Government of Canada very kindly provided funds at the very last moment, which really made it possible for us to launch the website at, uh, at Bucharest, the Ramsar Convention Secretariat. And within a region, the African Eurasian Waterbird Agreement has mechanisms, what are called the conservation status reviews, that allow updates of waterbird populations. And the Swiss government and the Iowa Secretariat supported the update within that region that fed into the water bird population estimates globally. So we would like to encourage region by region, flyway by flyway, more information to be updated on a regular basis that can feed into, in a streamlined way, the updates within the water bird population estimates, which should happen on a periodic basis as per the requirements of the Ramsar Convention and the various flyway agreements. With that, I think I will stop. And thank you very much. Thank you, Tej, for that, that very comprehensive overview of, of the population estimates um, and the different areas of different species and the different uses they can be put to. I do encourage you to, to, to visit the website and to, to give feedback. Um, uh, Tej is really serious when he, when he asks for, for, for your input into that, and I know he's good at taking criticism, so I do encourage you to, <laughs> to visit the site. Um, the, the last presentation is by uh, Dr. Kim Jin Han. He is Director of Research and Cooperation Division at the um, National Institute of Biological Resources, which is associated with the Ministry of Environment here in Korea. He's been very active also in water bird monitoring for many years. And he is a, a focal point for Korea for, for the East Asian Australasia Flyway Partnership. His presentation is entitled Water Birds Future Plus. I'm not totally sure what that means. That maybe the future of the motion or the future of the water birds, but I guess we'll find out shortly. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mine is the last talk, and I will focus on the future. And I will uh, adopt the trust, which we are in the uh, big meeting. This meeting is Nature Plus, and uh, I will adopt the trust explain about our water of the future for us. But as others said before, uh, the avian species are facing a crisis and many bird species are already extinct and others 
uh, threatened, vulnerable, in danger. So, uh, for making this, uh, we need some scientific data to announce to others. Well, the black, uh, the scoobie sandpiper, uh, the most endangered species uh, in our region, maybe uh, I think less than 100 pairs now. Uh, that was estimated in early 80s, uh, 4,000 or 6,000 individuals are exist. But now, very few are living and they face the extinction very closely. And uh, uh, ICN listed that this species as a critically endangered species. For identifying and for uh, making the birds <coughs> The, the red risk. Also, we need the uh, fundamental data of, of this species by monitoring. Well, for the future, I'd like to suggest one, one thing to uh, think about the CO2. Uh, some of you may think, oh, well, when, uh, when I talk about wildlife and bird, and I happen to uh, drive about CO2, well, in this meeting, the CO2 is one of the biggest global issues and others are, many of others are focused on the CO2 and I would like to call CO2 for uh, to our uh, agenda. Well, what about the future plus CO2, but uh, I would like to change the position of two. So, I'd like to uh, propose two CO's. One is coordination. The other one is cooperation between us. First, coordination. Good coordination is the best way to get uh, good results. Uh, I think, as you can see the map, uh, the Asian Australian Flyway, we already identified 700 uh, very key sites, but others still left <coughs> undiscovered, unsurveyed. Uh, and also, the Iowa region, Africa and Europe, they also white regions, which is not covered by the agreement. So, we need uh, to raise the coverage, and we need some good communication, and we need the development of method and toolkit. Uh, and also, we need to think about uh, how can we approach in a single species basis or a group approach. Well, Simba uh, talk about the black head spoonbill. We focus only one species. In that case, we can get a good result, but uh, the surveyor and the researcher have to visit that wetland or that habitat again and again to get other taxa and other species information. So we need Think about this matter. And development of, of reporting and information dismay, dissemination system is needed online and also offline. And well, this is maybe uh, very overlap with the uh, edges. Uh, coordination with the country, uh, site, site identification is the first, and the appointment and training of local leader. Local point, point, local point, point. But this is example from Korea. In, in 2009, we we had a site of 143 site of wintering water bird census. At the time, we had only uh, 75 teams. But in 2011, we we had 192 sites. That was 11.6 uh, percent raise. And we have 92 teams. This came from the uh, development of infrastructure. And the researchers trained by these teams. The teams, the leader teach the pupil, the student. And the student getting older and getting uh, started harder, and then he, he became a teacher. And coordination with, with the region, uh, volunteer recruitment is the, one of the most important things. Uh, 
uh, as you know, in Europe and America region, uh, they there are many volunteers, but in Asia and Africa region, we we have few volunteers. So we need some different systems. And education and training is also a very important thing. And next CEO is cooperation. And I'd like to raise one thing, reporting system. Well, we survey hard and hard, and they get data, but the data is too big for few people to deal with. So the report printed not every year, second or third, sometimes four. So we need to change that kind of analysis system and we need some kind of online and also offline system. That's because some researchers in a very remote area do not access the internet service. And about funding, this is one of the most important things. Uh, for race and census coverage, as I said before, uh, we need uh, double up or triple up the uh, coverage. And for adequate number of sensors to produce meaningful analysis. Sometimes we, if we only visit one